I had a subscriber reach out and ask if I could convert his Power Mac G5 Quad from Apple's notoriously unreliable liquid cooling system to something more durable, an air-cooled setup. This isn't a project you take on lightly. The Power Mac G5 Quad was the most powerful PowerPC Mac ever made, but it's also infamous for its failing Coology and Delphi liquid cooling systems. This video is the next installment in my ongoing Power Mac G5 series where I dive into the history, teardown, upgrades, and performance of these iconic machines. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, I've linked the full Power Mac G5 playlist above, so be sure to check those out. In today's episode, I'll walk you through the full teardown, the conversion process, and how I managed to mount dual air-cooled heat sinks in a system that was never designed for them. And of course, we'll put this converted G5 through a full round of benchmarks to see how it stacks up, not just on its own, but against my personal liquid-cooled Power Mac G5 quad. Let's get into it. This model originally came with dual 2.5 GHz dual-core CPUs, a 250 GB hard drive, 512 MB of RAM, and an NVIDIA GeForce 6800. However, this Quad Power Mac G5 came to me with some upgrades. It had 6.5 GB of RAM, two hard drives, one a 500 GB hard drive, and the other a 1 TB hard drive and the holy grail of Power Mac G5 graphics cards, the NVIDIA Quadro FX 4500 with 512 megabytes of RAM. I upgraded the RAM to the maximum allowed 16 gigabyte, but the real story here is the air cooling conversion. So I laid down a towel to protect the aluminum case, which is in excellent condition, and gently laid the Mac on its side. From there, I removed the front system fan, followed by the G5 aluminum heatsink cover. With those out of the way, we get our first good look at the Coology liquid cooling system. After removing the RAM and some protective shrouds, I used a hex toolkit, essential for G5 work, to unbolt the CPU assembly. There are 14 screws to remove and 4 screws to loosen, starting with these four, which require a 3mm hex driver. Next step are these six screws, also using the 3mm hex driver. Then these four short screws that mount the two processor terminal assemblies. These also require the 3mm hex driver. The final four screws need to be loosened using a 4mm hex driver. It was time to disconnect the pump cable and slowly lift the entire water-cooled assembly out of the chassis. When lifting it out, take note that there is adhesive attaching the liquid cooling system to the riser bar. Be sure not to rock the liquid cooling system to get it loose. Just apply pressure, pulling it straight up. And sure enough, we found coolant leakage. Not catastrophic, but enough to confirm this unit had indeed started failing. Thankfully, there didn't appear to be any damage to the logic board, so we dodged a bullet there. With the stock cooling system removed, the real challenge began converting this Quad G5 to air cooling. I had two working 2 gigahertz CPUs from an older model with proper air-cooled heat sinks, which I knew I was going to take the processors off and use the heat sinks for the air cooling. I initially was going to just transplant the 2.5 gigahertz CPUs that came with the computer onto the heat sinks, but quickly found out that the processors wouldn't fit onto the heat sinks. After some trial and error, I realized the processors from both versions of the liquid cooling system, the Coology and Delphi liquid systems, have the same part numbers, just slightly different configurations. So I took the processors from my Delphi liquid cooling system. Removing the processors from the liquid cooling system is pretty straightforward. Each processor has 10 black screws to remove, 
as well as four screws around the processor, which are all shown here in this image. Here you can see why I ended up going with the processor from my liquid cooling system unit. The passive heat sinks on the processors from this actual computer are too short and wouldn't fit onto the air-cooled heat sinks. And you can see here that the passive heat sinks from my computer are longer and fit perfectly around the air-cooled heat sink that I'm going to be using in this PowerMac G5. So I attached the donor CPUs to the air-cooled heat sink. Not all the screws were compatible, but enough of them were to secure the processors to the heat sink in a way I was comfortable with. With the CPUs mounted, I hit another roadblock, mounting the air-cooled heat sinks to the logic board. Only four screws lined up with the logic board, two for each processor. So on attempt one, I screwed the four screws in place and then attached four zip ties on the front side of the processor putting two zip ties on each processor, I put the computer back together, plugged the power cord in, and... All right, here we go. Nothing happened. Well, a quick white light turned on, then the computer immediately turned back off. But the good news is, that's the computer telling us the processors aren't properly seated. To confirm this, I laid the computer on its side and retried the power up, and this time it booted up correctly. So what that tells me is I just need to figure a better way to secure the processors to the logic board. In order to better secure the processors, I decided to go with eight zip ties and the four screws. This translates to four zip ties and two screws per processor. Two zip ties holding down the side towards the front, and two zip ties holding down the side of the processor facing the back. And for a little bit of overkill, I added two foam pads under the second processor for additional support. This setup secured the processor to the logic board to my satisfaction. Now it was time to retry the power on and confirm that my solution fixed the problem. And the good news is, this time the boot up was successful. It powered right on and loaded macOS Leopard. Just to be sure the processors were secured, off camera I powered off the computer and moved the machine around my house, picking it up and setting it down several times. After that, I plugged it all back in and everything was still fully functional. Before we wrap up the build section, I want to share a few important notes for those of you who might be considering this conversion yourself. The biggest piece of advice I can give is to be prepared to adapt. Before I started this project, I watched Big T's Tech Corner video on how to air convert the Quad Power Mac G5. I went into this repair feeling pretty confident that things would go smoothly, but I quickly learned that with the multiple revisions of Apple's liquid cooling system, Big T's guide isn't a one size fits all. The biggest issue I ran into was with the heat sink variations and CPU configurations. As you can see here, Big T's heat sinks were different than the ones I had on hand, especially in how the passive heat sinks were arranged. So just be ready to work through unexpected differences like that. Also, it's worth noting that the thermal calibration isn't necessary when converting a PowerMac G5 from liquid cooling to air cooling. The calibration process is designed to work with the liquid cooling system, which you're removing. I actually ran this machine for a full week without performing thermal calibration. I stress tested it and the temperatures stayed right where they should be. Later on, I decided to go through with the thermal calibration anyway, just to see what would happen. I had to temporarily reinstall the original liquid cooling system, ran the calibration, and then removed it again. The result? No difference at all. Temperatures and performance were exactly the same whether I calibrated it or not. Hey, really quick guys, if you're enjoying the content here on Circuit Sphere and want to help support the channel, I've set up a Patreon where you can chip in with a small monthly pledge. It really helps me keep creating the videos you love. And if a monthly commitment isn't your thing, no worries. You can also make a one-time contribution through Buy Me A Coffee. Links to both are in the description below, and every bit of your support means the world to me. Thank you. 
With the conversion complete, it's time to put this G5 to the test and see how it performs. As part of the sphere scale tests, I ran a full suite of performance benchmarks to see how this upgraded quad Power Mac G5 holds up. And I'll be comparing the results against my own personal liquid cooled quad G5. Starting with Geekbench 2, this machine pulled a score of 3,526 with 4,052 in integer performance and 4,342 in floating point. That edges out my personal liquid cooled quad G5, which scored 3,513 with nearly identical integer and floating point numbers. Memory performance was also neck and neck. 1,880 on this machine versus 1,888 on mine. And stream performance came in at 2,121 versus 2,106. The takeaway from a CPU standpoint, this air-cooled system performs just as well as the liquid-cooled original. Over in Xbench, this machine scored 138.7 compared to 168.57 on my SSD-equipped quad. The CPU and memory tests were close with this G5 hitting 149.19 on the CPU test and 164.56 on memory. While mine scored slightly higher with 150.60 and 157.36 respectively, the real gap showed up in the disk test. 83.81 on this hard drive based system versus a blazing 303.82 on my SSD Power Mac G5. Graphics benchmarks were surprisingly close, but there's an important difference to call out here. The air-cooled G5 is running an NVIDIA Quadro FX 4500 with 512 megabytes of VRAM, while my liquid-cooled system is equipped with an NVIDIA GeForce 7800 GT with 256 megabytes. So while my machine has a slower consumer GPU, the air-cooled system actually has more video memory and a workstation class card, which may explain why its OpenGL score came in at 104.85 and Quartz graphics test scored 180.78, nearly matching my G5's 107.02 and 182.61, despite the architectural differences between the cards. Then I ran Cinebench 2003, where the results again followed a similar trend. Both machines scored 271 in the single core CPU test, while the multi-core score came in at 750 on this build, actually beating my liquid cooled system, which scored 697. Graphics in Cinema 4D were within a few points, 339 on this G5 versus 336 on mine. OpenGL shading remained consistent with 962 for software lighting and 2,426 for hardware lighting on this system, compared to 961 and 2,225 on the liquid-cooled setup. So how does all that benchmark data translate into a real-world score? Enter the SphereScale Performance Score, my custom benchmark rating system that blends multiple tests into one unified score. It combines CPU, GPU, and storage performance using results from Geekbench 2, Xbench, and Cinebench 2003. The final score gives us a clear, balanced picture of how well a vintage Mac actually performs in the real world. The air-cooled Power Mac G5 earned a SphereScale performance score of 953. That's incredibly close to my personal liquid-cooled Quad G5, which holds a score of 986. The difference? Storage. My machine is running a fast SSD, while the air-cooled build is still using a traditional hard drive. If this Mac had been upgraded to an SSD, it would have taken the top spot as the highest performing computer on version 2 of the SphereScale performance score. It's pretty remarkable that an air-cooled Quad G5 built from donor parts nearly matched and arguably outperformed in some areas a factory liquid-cooled system. That's a huge win for anyone looking to preserve these machines without the risk of liquid cooling failure. Of course, 
Performance is only part of the story. Let's break down the Sphere Score version 2 to get the full picture. Starting with build quality, it scores a perfect 5 out of 5. Normally, the Quad G5 would earn a 4 here due to the risk of liquid cooling failure. But since this one has been fully converted to air cooling, that concern is off the table. With no liquid to leak out and damage the logic board, this build earns top marks. For aesthetic and design, it gets a solid 4 out of 5. The aluminum tower design is sleek, iconic, and well-balanced. Still impressive, even by today's standards. When it comes to expandability and upgrade potential, it's an easy 5 out of 5. With 8 RAM slots, dual drive bays, and room for GPU upgrades, this machine was, and still is, an enthusiast's dream. On historical significance, it scores a 4 out of 5. The Power Mac G5 Quad was the final and most powerful PowerPC Mac ever made before Apple made the transition to Intel. It marked the end of an era and pushed the PowerPC architecture to its limits. And finally, Legacy and Collector Value gets a 5 out of 5. Among vintage Mac collectors, the Quad G5, especially one that's been restored or upgraded, is a highly sought-after machine. Its rarity, performance, and historical placement make it a true collector's piece. And with a score of 23 out of 25, this becomes the new Sphere Score leader on version 2 of the Sphere Scale spreadsheet. If you'd like to view the full Sphere Scale spreadsheet and compare other vintage Macs, there's a link in the description below. And if you want to submit your own Mac benchmarks to be featured in this spreadsheet, just click the submission form also linked in the description. I've also put a video link above that walks you through the submittal process step by step. Looking back, this product turned out to be one of the most challenging but also one of the most rewarding restorations I've done here on CircuitSphere. Taking a liquid-cooled PowerMac G5 quad, stripping it down, and giving it new life with an air-cooled setup wasn't easy, but the results speak for themselves. Not only did it boot up and run flawlessly, but it also went toe-to-toe -to -toe with my own liquid-cooled G5 in benchmark performance and nearly took the top spot on both Sphere Scale and Sphere Score charts. This goes to show that with the right parts, a little ingenuity, and a lot of patience, these machines can be well preserved and even improved well beyond what Apple originally shipped. Whether you're a collector, a PowerPC enthusiast, or just someone who appreciates great engineering, this is proof that the G5 Quad still has a lot to offer in 2025. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive restoration and want to see more projects like it, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to view the full Sphere Scale spreadsheet and compare other vintage Macs, there's a link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.